the term adaptation in literature studies. We're usually talking about book-to-film or book-to-TV adaptations, since those are the most common forms. But there's so much more we could be talking about, like film to book, graphic novel to film, to book, toys to cartoons and comics, to films, urban legend to web series and video games, and then films, or, in the case of today's video, podcast to graphic novel. Now, the dominant cultural conversation around adaptations always ends up being something along the lines of which was better, the book or the movie, or which was better, the comic or the TV show. To me, these conversations always sound a bit like this. More importantly, which is better, Paris or Rome? Better? Paris. Which is better, Prague or Budapest? Why does it matter which is better? Prague. So this clip is ridiculous, because how is one city necessarily better than another? How would you quantify that? Especially when you're talking about two famously great cities in the world. I feel a similar way about adaptations, because you're usually comparing a book, which is entirely textual, to a film, an audiovisual medium. The viewing experience is so inherently different to the reading experience. For instance, I watch bad movies for fun, but I cannot sit through a badly written book. Now, all this isn't to say that all adaptations are equal. A lot of the time, it's incredibly obvious that a work isn't at a similar level to its source. This is why the attitude of, the book is always better, still reigns supreme in a lot of people's minds. Despite the fact that A, that's just an opinion, and B, if you think about it for more than just a couple of minutes, it's a pretty hard position to defend. Here are a couple of examples of movies that I preferred to their book counterparts. And those are just Steven Spielberg adaptations. And also just my opinions. Like how Dogbit thought that Paris is better than Rome. Better is a relative term. So to me, when analysing adaptations, the interesting question isn't which is better, but instead, how and why is it different? Or, what distinguishes these mediums of storytelling from another? Or, what did they change and why? Now with the intro out of the way, let's look at a really interesting case study in adaptation. The Adventure Zone Volume 1, Here There Be Goblins, which was adapted from the podcast titled The Adventure Zone. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you know who the McElroy brothers are. But just in case, the McElroys are three brothers from Huntington, West Virginia, named Justin, Travis, and Griffin. Together they host a massively popular podcast called My Brother, My Brother, and Me, where they give improvised comedic advice to listeners' questions. In 2014, they put out a My Brother, My Brother, and Me episode featuring themselves and their father, radio veteran Clint McElroy, playing Dungeons and Dragons. The episode was well received, and they turned it into a fortnightly podcast of its own, called The Adventure Zone. The Adventure Zone starts as a simple sword and sorcery fantasy comedy tale. Griffin serves as the dungeon master, while Justin plays Taco the Elf Wizard, Travis plays Magnus Burnsides, the human fighter, and Clint plays Merle Highchurch, the dwarven cleric. The trio are hired by Merle's cousin, Gundren Rockseeker, to take some supplies from Neverwinter to Phandalin, planning to meet them there to discuss the last job they'll ever need. Of course, nothing goes to plan. The trio are pulled into a larger plot and things get crazier and crazier. Now it's fair to say that the podcast has been a wild success. It's repeatedly in the top of Apple's charts, the McElroys have sold out live shows across America, and there's a thriving fan community online. The first D&D based story arc, subtitled Balance, ran for 69 episodes, becoming a more deep and complex story as it unfolded. What started as a breezy back and forth between four family members evolved into a story with real moral consequences and complicated characters. The Adventure Zone falls under a subcategory of podcasts called Actual Play. That is to say, people actually playing a game and recording it. Telling a story through the Actual Play podcast format is interesting for a number of reasons. Now, you might assume that in Dungeons & Dragons, the Dungeon Master would be serving as the game's narrator. And you would be partially right. But really, it's a game with multiple narrators. The DM acts as the primary narrator, setting up the situation, 
but then each of the players, out of character, will typically narrate their own actions. For example... And then uh, you hear a banging, uh, almost like um, somebody's hitting something against something else. You can't exactly... Unless you see it, you can't really tell what the what the noise is. But you hear a pretty terrible sound coming from down there. Uh, and top of the order is Magnus. Um, so I am going to hole up in that. In- they're coming from behind us? They are coming from uh, – nobody's coming. You can't really determine. The voices you heard are actually coming from the, uh, in front of you, behind the overpass. The overpass is in front of you. Behind that is, is deeper. Okay, great. I'm going to post up and move to in front of that overpass, the entrance in the overpass, so I'm going to ready in action. So this clip goes from Griffin, narrating in the second person perspective as the DM, inviting decisions from the players. Then Travis narrates his character's action, this time in the first person perspective. So D&D is essentially a game where each player trades the role of narrator back and forth with the DM and each other, while all of them perform as characters along the way. The multiple narrators in D&D and other role-playing games is what makes the game, and therefore these podcasts, so unpredictable. Another particular beauty of the podcast form is that it allows for long run times. Episodes of My Brother, My Brother and Me usually run for about an hour, and the brothers were very successful at that length, so it was no shock that that's how long episodes of The Adventure Zone ended up going. Other shows in the actual play genre can routinely run for multiple hours. This sort of runtime leaves a lot of space to play, and in this space, the McElroys routinely diverge from the game to improvise comedy bits, some having little to no relation to the game at all. So poor people love Magnus, that's what you're saying. That is correct. He is Um, the, he is the, he's the Larry the Cable guy of of our team. (laughs) He's the Cheetos of people. Listen, I reach out to real America, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and real America loves Magnus. They well, don't real get taco, real Faerun or forgotten real Faerun, realms, or wherever you know, the like hell the real down home Faerun. They yeah, love yeah. me. The best part about these bits, in my opinion, is that they always just feel like a family trying to make each other laugh. Then when they laugh, I do. Not only at the joke, but with the others who are laughing. It's contagious and rarely feels forced. Now, while the episodes do go on for an hour or so, they're usually well edited. D&D is a game with a lot of dice rolling, rule checking, character form flipping, spell googling, a lot of fluff. But by pre-recording and cutting down on these elements, the Adventure Zone becomes a much more streamlined event than, say, listening to your older brother and his friends playing D&D in the next room. I cut a lot out when I edit, which I usually do the day or sometimes the night before because my um, life is in shambles. And uh, I I cut like a lot of I cut a lot of stuff out like this is the most heavily edited thing I make. Um, And so just like cutting down the recording to something that is listenable without like long, long pauses for rule checks and um, like decisions on what actions to take. Uh, I, I cut like maybe a fifth or a, to a quarter out of the whole recording and that takes a really long time. As a podcast, The Adventure Zone is a well-told story, played by a family with brilliant chemistry both in and out of character. But how is this all different in the form of a graphic novel? So the graphic novel was adapted by Clint McElroy, the brother's father and the player who played as Merle as well as professional artist Carrie Peach, who is an active member of the Adventure Zone fandom. Where the podcast has a lot of room to play around in, the graphic novel does not. Clint and Carrie essentially had to boil down eight or nine hours of podcasting into just 238 pages of a graphic novel. So a lot of bits, especially the out-of-character ones, are cut down on or removed entirely. This leads to a more streamlined but less sprawling work. The pace of the podcast in the early episodes is a bit wandering, whereas the graphic novel hits the ground running. This is also a side effect of the action in comics being so much quicker than the rolling and silent adding needed for Dungeons & Dragons. For instance, the action on this one page represents about three minutes of audio. This is such a different experience to hearing one of the brothers say, I rolled a 12 when describing the battle. The podcast has slightly more suspense, minute to minute, due to the nature of D&D gameplay. As a listener, you wonder if that 12 is enough to hit, 
and there's always the slight pause while Griffin does the maths. Then, after the hit's gone through, there's a strict order of initiative that rules over who will move and when, and this is all opposed to just seeing it happen on the page of the graphic novel. Another way Clinton Carey handled the adaptation was by taking some of the out-of-character bits and putting them into the mouths of the characters. Merle, where are you? What are you doing? What's I am uh, probably studying my cantrips. Okay. <laughs> just repairing. <laughs> well, I'm just say masturbating, Dad. <laughs> Thought. Don't come like in, you. Mom. I'm studying my kid. <laughs> because something about this whole thing stinks to me. I've never Why, liked um, Gundren, and I think there's something up. In the podcast, this is clearly said by Travis out of character, as he says, Dad, at the end. It's Travis talking to his father, Clint, not Magnus talking to Merle. But it's a quality joke, so they chose to adapt it for the comic, despite not having Travis or Clint existing as characters. So instead, they put it into the mouths of the characters they were playing, and the bit still works. So Griffin is the youngest McElroy brother, who acted as the dungeon master for this game. It was obvious from the outset that each of the other family members would have their characters prominently featured in the graphic novel, but it wasn't obvious what Griffin's role as the DM would have been in the adaptation. Griffin's role as DM could easily have been reduced to a simple text box, the typical way comics have handled narration. If they wanted to use the text box and keep it interactive, they could have had the players argue with it. It's a trope used often in the Deadpool comics of Daniel Way, for instance. However, the adaptation did something fairly interesting. It put Griffin, as the DM, into the graphic novel as a character. The DM Griffin pops into different corners of panels to instruct, deride, or otherwise interact with the characters of the story, while also pushing the narrative forward. It's through these interactions that the graphic novel makes the metafictional aspect of the story clear. This comic is about three people playing a game of Dungeons & Dragons. While DM Griffin helps to acknowledge that this is just a game of D&D, they never fully part the kimono. It's not hard to imagine a very different version of this graphic novel, where fictional versions of the other McElroys also appeared in their own bubbles, to interact with DM Griffin or to do the out-of-character bits. Another way they could have done it would have been to create two separate realities, one of the so-called real world. Picture the four of them sitting around a table, complete with dice, chips, and Mountain Dew. And then another reality of the fantasy world, which the characters inhabited. This would have been an easy way to get all of those out-of-character bits into the story and hang on to the multiple narrator framework of the podcast. This use of multiple layers in reality has been done before in comics, including Joe the Barbarian, Image Comics' Non-Player, and The Max. All of these works use two different layers of reality to different effect, but it's usually clear when the story switches between the two. They could also have framed the narrative in a similar fashion to The Princess Bride, by using the real world as just a framing device, popping in and out to comment on and bookend the story. Or they could have used reality in a similar manner to the Lego movie, only revealing the metafictional layer towards the end of the story as a twist. As in, oh my god, it was D&D all along. Another direction they could have gone in was that of Scott Pilgrim, leaning heavily into the RPG aspect of the story, creating HP bars and displaying dice roll totals. Having said all that, I think the use of DM Griffin was a really elegant and interesting solution. It boiled down a game of many narrators into just one, and allowed for metatextual inserts and consistent humour without pulling the reader completely out of the narrative. This allowed the graphic novel to be extremely self-referential, just like the podcast. But the graphic novel only ever knocks against the fourth wall, while never quite breaking it. You could almost read this work as if the characters were real, and the DM Griffin was some fifth-dimensional god there to mess with them. Have you ever watched an anime that's ended before the original source manga has finished its run? Because those adaptations can get weird. Fortunately, this adaptation began after the completion of the balance arc of the Adventure Zone. The adapters know exactly where the story is going, and what's going to happen along the way. This amount of hindsight means that Clint and Carrie know what sort of character evolution is going to happen down the road of this story. One of the interesting side effects of this is that they manage to ascribe many character traits 
to the main characters in the graphic novel, which weren't revealed narratively until way later in the podcast. Remember, when they started the show, it was just supposed to be an experimental fill-in episode to make way for some paternity leave. Apart from Travis, none of the players had a detailed backstory for their character. These elements weren't filled in until much later in the podcast, but the adaptation decides to introduce these character traits early on, giving the reader a better idea of who the characters are. For instance, there are several mentions of Taco's past as a travelling celebrity chef, whereas this backstory was only fully revealed by Justin in episode 48. While adding this part to Taco, they also took away his quest to discover the Taco, that is, the Tex-Mex food, in the fantasy world. I guess it's okay, Justin, because like in the, in, the, in the infinite world of fantasy I'm about to craft for you, maybe tacos don't exist already. And it's just in the traditional sense. Oh my god, the, a taco my whole is, goal is not realized. My goal for this adventure anything. is for, to invent the taco. It's sure. Goal for salsa. This was a joke Justin decided on in the first episode, and the brothers stuck with it for a while before it seemed to get in the way of the game they were playing. The silly nature of this quest kind of interfered with the story as it got more and more serious, and they got tired of it. So never bring it up in the first place is a solid decision. One thing I noticed about Merle was that he appears as far more caring towards his cousins in the adaptation. This should make later reveals about his family, ones that don't happen until episode 50 of the podcast, much more powerful, as we've already seen him be open to these characters. It also turns Merle into the emotional centre of the first volume, and I enjoyed his character arc a lot. Another small touch is that Merle acts as a cleric for Pan to begin with, where this is another thing that got retconned later into the podcast in episode 9. Even something as simple as teasing Magnus's love of wooden ducks is nice to see as a fan of the original work. There are some more spoilery bits that I'll get into later, but my point is that while the graphic novel is only an adaptation of the first seven or eight episodes of the podcast, it's able to use knowledge of the next 60 episodes to lay a strong foundation for the overall story. Actually, while I'm talking about foundations... Let's talk about the podcast's source material. The first episode of the podcast makes it clear that the McElroys are playing a pre-written D&D adventure from the starter set, entitled Lost Mine of Fandelva. So, the chain of adaptation isn't as simple as podcast to graphic novel. It's actually Lost Mine of Fandelva to The Adventure Zone episodes 1 to 8 to The Adventure Zone volume 1, Here There Be Gerblins. If you go through the pre-written adventure, a lot of the beginning of the first arc is in here. To quote, Lost Mine of Foundelva is divided into four parts. 1. Goblin Arrows The adventurers are on the road to the town of Fandolin when they stumble into a goblin ambush. Check. They discover that the goblins have captured their dwarf friend, Gundren Rockseeker. Check. And his escort, a human warrior named Sildar Holwinter. And there we have it. This is only page three of the pre-written adventure, and you can already see where the McElroys have started to put their twist on the adaptation. Here's what happened in the podcast when they introduced the character of Sildar Holwinter. So Gundren is uh, actually going up ahead of you guys okay. with a, uh, a fighter escort named Sildar Holwinter, whom you've never met. He was not actually at the tavern last Mixer. night. He was not at the wine mixer for you guys. Uh, <laughs> and his name one more time. Uh, Sildar Hallwinter. Um, yeah. It sounds disgusting. Barry, I'm just going to call him silly. Very blue jeans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can um, call. That's what I'm saying. This is our game. We can do whatever we want. I can start calling these creeps very blue jeans and. Uh, yeah, you're good. Uh, okay. Okay, because Sildar Hallwinter does not stick in my head, but Barry Blue Jeans, I'll never. Okay, bl Barry Blue Jeans is it. That's his name now. <laughs> so. In the podcast, you get a great moment of meta-humor about the ridiculousness of fantasy names. Then, Griffin picks a name equally as ridiculous, but far more up the McElroy Alley, Barry Blue Jeans. In the graphic novel, however, this is just his name. It's another effect of the hindsight I mentioned earlier. Now, all locations used in the first arc of the podcast are mentioned here in Lost Mine, but the narrative begins to change fairly quickly, when Griffin changes the nature of what's in the mine. They still use the outline of Lost Mine's villain, the Black Spider, but quickly turning him into Magic Brian, 
again, sort of McElroyifying the original content to become something different. By using Lost Mine as the original source, the Adventure Zone gets to use several familiar standard D&D scenarios for the McElroys to improvise humour over. Now, I wouldn't go as far as calling this a parody, since the adventure and action is all done in earnest, but they put their own comedic twist on it wonderfully. One of the most interesting aspects of adapting the podcast to the graphic novel is that the names of places and characters have been changed. For instance, Clark the Bugbear becomes Ganache. The town of Phandalin in the adventure and the podcast then became Haverdale in the graphic novel. By changing these names, they were able to turn this into a more indirect adaptation, i.e. one that doesn't have to pay licensing features to the copyright holders of D&D. It's smart because there's not much difference to these names anyway. Lost Mine of Fandelva is sold in a starter's set for the 5th edition of the game. This version of D&D has been around since 2014, and the game has surged in popularity since. So surely this particular game has been played tens of thousands of times, maybe even hundreds. Due to the nature of D&D, each of those games is unique in its own way, with differently used players and non-player characters. Now, I think the only reason we wouldn't typically think of each individual game as an adaptation is that generally they're not recorded. So the question becomes, if there's no record of them, do they exist as adapted texts? I personally would argue that D&D is a shared storytelling experience. It even says so on page 2 of Lost Mine of Fandelva. And this is something that exists within the oral storytelling tradition. This is especially true when it comes to players recounting the highlights of their adventure to other people at a later date. If you were to accept this definition, then the D&D pre-written adventures might just be some of the most adapted texts of all time. Right behind the Bible or Spider-Man. So I'm going to go a bit into the ending of the graphic novel here, but also the ending of the entire balance arc of the podcast as well. So if you're watching this and haven't finished the podcast, you might want to skip to the next section, the timestamp of which should appear here. I really liked the changes the graphic novel made to the ending. So in the podcast, the group chooses to free a young orc boy from would-be slavers on the way back to town, while following Gundren's trail of destruction. Then, later, when Gundren is about to let go of the Phoenix Fire Gauntlet, that same orc boy shoots him with an arrow, provoking the destruction of the entire town. In the graphic novel, however, the one who provokes Bogard into destroying the town is the gang's companion, Barry Bluejeans. The podcast ends on a slightly ironic note. By freeing the orc boy, they doomed the entire town. It is, frankly, a bummer. The graphic novel's ending instead has a much more established character acting. The moral of the story becomes that people around you can act rashly and cause destruction. And it also lends more credence to Barry Bluejean's death. Another sort of big change is the previously mentioned bit of Taco no longer having the quest to invent the Taco. So this is obviously going to change the story's overall ending. In the podcast, Taco meets Joaquin through his taco truck on our world, learns how to make tacos, and then unlocks a sort of magical power. So unless they're going to introduce the quest to invent the taco later on, this is going to have to change. That's going to be an interesting thing to keep an eye on as the rest of the graphic novels are hopefully produced. The final thing I want to talk about here is the really incredible job I think Carrie Peach did with the artwork. Each character is lively and expressive, and the humour is pulled off wonderfully, while the pacing of the book is spot on. On top of that, the colouring is beautiful and helps set the tone on every single page. For my money, the best sequence comes on page 53, when the charmed bugbear is questioning his mutinous workers. Panel 1 shows the goblins entering. Ganache starts to ask a question before he's cut off. Panel 2 shows Yavi taking a shot with the bow and arrow. Panel 3 is framed from the same angle as panel 1. It's a bit like shot, reverse shot, shot. And it shows the arrow making contact, with the bloody looking lettering of Chawunk appearing. Then panel 4 is a tight close-up on Ganache, the arrow seemingly embedded in his chest, as he reacts by saying, oh. 
Finally, panel 5 pulls back and reveals that Magnus jumped forward at the last second to intercept the arrow with his shield. If you look back, this was even set up on panel 1, which shows Magnus in the first stages of reaction by turning his head. The book is full of really strong moments of comic book storytelling like this. Another aspect of the graphic novel that was also handled by Peach is the lettering. For those of you who don't know, lettering is exactly what it sounds like. It's the person who puts in all the letters into the book to create dialogue, narration, and sound effects. Lettering is often one of those things that a lot of readers won't notice unless it's done particularly poorly, but it's a crucial part to making a good comic. It's also the aspect of a comic that best represents audio on page, and since this material is adapted from an audio format, it had to be good for this book to work. And boy, was this book well lettered. The sound effect work is really solid and often very funny. For instance, look at the scrunch splat that forms around the mace here. But Peach also takes different iconic audio moments from the podcast and highlights them specially by breaking the dialogue out of a speech bubble. For instance, on page 44, when DM Griffin suggests throwing the wolf into the fire pit, the first panel of page 45 is Magnus loudly proclaiming, I do that. This is mirroring a much more low-key version of the exchange in the podcast. The next panel has Taco mocking Magnus's catchphrase, making it clear that these big moments are essentially catchphrase moments. Then, on page 155, Mel gets one for his first Zone of Truth. Taco gets another one of these moments on page 138, but it's one of the most iconic moments of the first arc, and I don't want to spoil the image here. These moments are used sparingly, so when it happens, it's always a pleasant surprise. Another nice touch was how she created the static effect for the comic. It's clearly meant to sound like static, just from what the letters look like, but the shading around the word bubble really makes the effect come through. That's just a handful of examples, but the lettering in this book really helped ensure a smooth adaptation from audio to visual. The Adventure Zone really is an interesting adaptation. From an original source that's been adapted countless times before and since, the McElroys were able to create their own unique tale. From there, Clint and Carrie were able to hone in on the important moments of the podcast and streamline them into a wonderful graphic novel. All the while, varied and beautiful works by fans of both the podcast and the comic are still being made on a daily basis. And all this, just because they needed a fill-in episode for a paternity break. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm aiming to do a series on kind of weirder adaptations like these, so please subscribe if you want more. And if you can think of any other odd cases that you'd like to see an episode about, drop a comment below.